Welcome everyone to Dead Talk Live, and today we have special guest, writer, director Mark W. Curran and Madison Spear uh, from the movie Hoodman, which was released this past May. Is that correct, Mark? That is correct. It was released on May the 1st. And it has rave fan reviews. How does that make you feel? Uh, it makes, makes me feel great, yes. I mean, it's... Uh, it's Nice to be, it's nice to have something out there that people like. Uh, for me, I don't even read critic reviews. I just go straight to the fan reviews. I don't care what the critics have to say. So let's talk about Hoodman. Now, Madison, thank you so much for being here with us. You are the lead. You play Ariana in the movie. Tell our audience what Ariana is about. Um. So first of all, I just want to thank the fans. I mean, it's been such an amazing, amazing process and journey. And, you know, the fan support is what keeps us going. Absolutely. Uh, the movie itself was such a whirlwind and we all had so much fun. Um, and the carry on, uh, character of Ariana uh, was so amazing to play just because she's going through hell um, and she stays strong throughout it. Um, throughout the craziest um, couple of nights, because it all takes place over, like all of the trauma takes place in these uh, few nights. And uh, all of it comes from this place of trying to save her family and trying to solve a mystery of what happens to her son. Exactly. Um, so everything kind of comes from a place of love. And that was such just a fun um, thing to be playing with the entire time and having an amazing director like Mark makes it so easy to do my job. So it was a blast. Now, Mark, um, you're the, you came up with the story, you directed the movie. What was your inspiration for Hood Man? Well, it first started with a location. Uh, when you're shooting really low budget movies, you have to have a location first. Or at least that's how I always approach my projects. Because if you have a central location, then you can write the story around that rather than having a screenplay and then having to go out and try to locate those locations, which are almost impossible to get. So I first started with a location that I knew I had, which was uh, a house in Artesia. And basically, we started there, and I began to kind of brainstorm. It, it started out as sort of... Uh, a vague idea about a man who, a hooded man who goes door to door in, on Halloween and just randomly knocks on doors and terrorizes and picks one family and just decides to go after them. And then that grew into a sort of an urban legend idea. And the story is sort of like a crime, suspense, mystery, all wrapped up into one. Uh, was that your initial approach, or did it just evolve yes. that way? No, it, it basically, I wanted, I kind of stick to the crime, mystery, thriller genre with kind of horror kind of as a sideline, because it, it, it's sort of being marketed as a horror movie, but it really isn't an out-and-out -out horror film, mm -mm. As, we would, as we would normally see. Uh, it, it's definitely more in the kind of, I, I try to, I try to, uh, I try to describe it more like a noir or a neo-noir mm -hmm. kind of approach to a mystery, thriller, and a horror crime drama all put together into one. Yep, that sounds about right. Now, Madison, when you were auditioning, I assume for Mark, uh, mm -hmm. what kind of information did he give you uh, to properly, properly audition for the role? Um... So he actually didn't give us a ton of the script, I think, because he wanted to keep it a mystery. Um, so actually, the information we got, um, I got a little bit of a breakdown of who the character was um, and a very vague plot line of the story. But I could just tell from the breakdown that um, it was going to be a really cool project. Um, and then the sides that he gave us were actually just monologues, I think, Mark. Uh, so really like just having to delve into who the character was you're not feeding off of another person you're really just trying to like figure out who this character was so the minute I got like the sides I knew I was excited about the project and I wanted in and I sent in my audition and then um, I think we met and got lunch 
uh, mm-hmm. just to talk over the film and get to know each other. And while I was at lunch, I actually told Mark that I am a huge scaredy cat. Um, and that usually when it comes to movies, like horror movies, I am the worst person to go with. I'm and like covering my you're eyes. You're not alone, Madison. You would be surprised how many actors I've interviewed in the horror realm who are just like you. Uh, I am the worst person to go to the movies with when it comes to a horror movie. But I told him, I said, I'm not going to have to act. I'm just going to be legitimately terrified the entire time. <laughs> now, so, oh, go I on. was terrified myself that we were going to run out of money. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is your first lead in a feature film. Uh, were you nervous, you know, being the lead in a feature film? Were you excited? Walk us through what you were feeling. Um, I definitely was more excited than nervous just because um, Mark and the rest of the cast from the beginning uh, really just made me feel so comfortable, so safe. Um, I loved the script, so I felt passionate about it. I knew that I could do it as much justice as I possibly could. But there was definitely a part of me that was scared shitless, for sure, because (laughs) it's a big project and it's a lot of responsibility. But um, with Mark at the helm, um, I knew that we would be okay and that he would be able to pull whatever he needed out of me. So it was more of an excitement, for sure. Now, Mark, how hard was it to find your Ariana? It was pretty difficult. Uh, you know, casting is really the central part of, the, of any film. Yeah. And if you don't have that right, the whole thing can fall apart. And it can fall apart not only at the beginning, it, it can also fall apart in the middle. It can fall apart at the very end where you think you have a strong lead and then things start to unravel during the story, or during the course of the shooting because things get, people get tired, long schedules, things like that. So I did put out, I cast a pretty wide net for the role. And I, I think I probably auditioned roughly 2,000 actors. Holy shit. Yeah. And uh, I, I was getting toward the end, and I was thinking I, just, I wasn't happy with the people that I had. And Madison was one of the last ones to send her tape in. It was well past the deadline. Are you calling me out, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> it was well past the deadline, and I was getting pretty, you know, freaked out. I had one person picked out that I thought might be able to do it, but I wasn't confident completely. And when I saw when I saw Madison's audition, that was it. I mean, I knew it. So, it's like you know it, you know. Like so, I just did. Just you know, a it's, feeling. It's, had it. Yeah, just yeah. a feeling you got that this is Ariana. This is who I want to portray this role. Yeah, and and what was really amazing about it was Madison doesn't have a lot of experience. I mean, she she's pretty new. Mm-hmm. She had just moved out here, hadn't done a lot of stuff. She'd done, I think, you had done one feature before, or maybe... Yeah, uh, I had done, uh, like, two features as uh, supporting characters, but... Um, okay. Yeah, I was two years since I had been out in L.A. when I, uh, you know, got Hoodman, so... Yeah, that, that, that surprised me, because she, she beat out a lot of actresses that had a lot more experience than she did and so I, I think she has she has that natural ability and there's something I don't know I think it was I saw something in her that was reminiscent of the actresses of the 40s mm-hmm. 30s and the 40s uh, a, a certain look and that struck me because she has an unusual kind of look it's, it's sort of a I call it a classic beauty but mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, but but she but she had the talent coupled with a very good screen look, and I thought would would be perfect. That's awesome for this particular role. Yeah. Now, Mark, this was like your third directing endeavor. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but from the yeah. prior projects that you have done, uh, what did you learn that was most significant that you brought to Hoodman? From each of the previous experiences? Yeah, yeah, something that you've gained, you didn't know before you did it before, and, you know, you went into Hoodman more prepared than you were in your prior to directing uh, well, endeavors. Well, the, the big, I think the biggest thing is to allow the actors to play with the role a little bit. You know, in other words, don't over-rehearse. 
and allow the actors to kind of, when they find the role, sometimes, sometimes it takes a little time to find the character and find the role. Mm -hmm. And if you lock somebody into a script too tightly, they can't improvise freely. So there's something about the spontaneity of being able to just know what you know the approach you're going to take toward a character but not be locked into the script word for word that makes perfect sense now how important to you was it mark to build up the uh, urban legend that you were describing earlier and the world in general in which these characters live in well the urban legend was the center of the story so that had to be built up fairly significantly from the beginning uh, we had to establish the fact that in this particular small town, this urban legend had persisted for many, many years. And there had been a lot of disappearances of children in this town as far back as anyone could remember. So that was an important part of it. Um, urban legends in general have been around for a very long time. Okay. They're, they're more of the modern equivalent of folk tales. Yeah. And so... It's really, that's kind of a fertile ground for, uh, for a mystery as well as a horror movie. So I think in that context, it was very important to get that urban legend idea out from the very beginning so people wouldn't be confused as to the events that were leading up to the actual sighting of the villain, which is the hood man. The hood man. <laughs> now, Madison, you have done, you mentioned just a minute ago, you were a supporting cast member in two prior films. Uh, before that, you had done a lot of shorts. Uh, what was the biggest, what would you say to up-and-coming actors who are currently doing shorts or have done shorts and they get into a feature film like you did as the lead, uh, what advice would you give them? Um, my advice is um, probably get to know the character as much as you possibly can. Do your homework. Um, because you want to have that all done before you get on set. Um, you know, things change so rapidly. Um, and, you know, with a low budget film like ours, um, we were, you know, running all day long. So really just, I had to have this firm grasp of the character from day one. So I spent several weeks of just my own, uh, preparing and studying the script and, uh, figuring out kind of what made Ariana tick. And mm -hmm. it made my job so much easier on set because I wasn't stressed the entire time about, oh, what's going on in the scene? What are my lines for this scene? I had that all done so that when I got to set, I could just play the entire time um, and just really delve into this uh, crazy story that Mark concocted. Uh, so definitely do your homework and then uh, trust in yourself too. Just trust that you're there for a reason mm -hmm. and that you got on set for a reason they saw something in you so having that trust in your own ability and just letting whatever you have just all out on the table i think is you know the best thing that you could possibly do how does it make you feel when mark said that he looked at 2000 auditions before picking you i i didn't know it was 2000 i'm over here like oh my you god you know i thought i told you yeah, it it was uh, it was pretty crazy. Of course, it's it's all done with tape. You know, it's all done with tape now. Yeah. Well, yeah. what are your feelings on that, Mark? And you know, the world we live in now, technology, COVID, auditions well, being done with I mean, tape. Well, COVID's not fabulous, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I mean, the technology it's it's amazing. I but mean, can you, know, you get a feel of an actor through just a tape? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. That's fair. Yeah, because, I mean, that's the medium that they're they're going to be delivering on. So they're looking into a camera. That's why I always go with a monologue. Well, you almost have to go with a monologue unless you have someone else that the actor knows that they read with. Okay. But if, if they can, if an actor can get into the character's head and do a monologue, look straight into the camera and deliver and be believable then you got it you got it perfect sense. she did i mean there's there's something about truthfulness and honesty it's not tr it's not truth and honesty at its at its heart because you're acting 
but you have to bring a certain authenticity to it mm -hmm. and people and, and a certain truth. Now, I'm not an actor, so I can't tell you how that's done. Not yet. Uh, I only know what my intention is as, as a writer, what I'd like to see as a director, and the rest of it is up to the actor. So you're totally dependent on, on the actor's ability to be able to do that, and it, and it's it can't be easy. I mean, it's got exactly. I'm in all of it. So. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that brings me to my next point. Uh, sure. We have all seen plenty of films, and I want to direct this to you, Madison, as an actor, uh, where you're watching these two actors on a film, TV show, whatever, but you know they're acting. And it's something you, I can't put my finger on. It's not like they're, they're doing a bad job. It's just that you know that they're acting. What is the secret, for you at least, to when your audience is watching you on the screen for them not to know that you're acting and for them to be pulled into the world that you are portraying? Great question. Uh, for me, I think it's different for every actor. Every actor has a different approach to um, how they get into the story and how they deliver a believable performance. So for me, I have to find something in a scene where I relate to the character. So I don't have any children, but Ariana does. And that's a huge part of the story is her child and her relationship to her child. And so from the beginning, I had to find something with that that I could relate to. And so by thinking about that and thinking about my own personal family um, and what I would do as Madison if something ever happened to them, if some, you know, monster or something like, took one of them, how I would react. And so by observing and thinking about what I, Madison, would do, I can then in, like kind of imbue that into my character. So finding something that I relate to in the character is always the most important, and it's the first thing that I do. It's the first step I take as an actor. It makes perfect sense. It, it helps bring authenticity to the role that you are playing. One of the great aspects of the film is the question of whether what we see, Mark, is real or imaginary. Yeah. Uh, how do you go about setting up those scenes when you were developing the script and eventually when you got behind the camera? Well, what's tricky is that it, you can never show the villain, at least in this particular case. The whole thing revolved around this hood man only existing if you believed in him. Mm -hmm. So anytime the audience would see it, it would have to be from the standpoint of, of the character themselves seeing it. In other words, when Ari, when Ariana saw Hoodman, we were looking at the story through her eyes. So we could we couldn't show him when she couldn't see him. So that got a little that got a little tricky. Um, you, you have to do that with each character. So what seems like a, like a pretty simple story on its surface, when you when you think about when you're when you're actually shooting it, you have to you have to do it in a way that it's seamless so that you don't have a character seeing it when they wouldn't be aware of yeah. seeing it, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it's, and it sounds very tricky to pull off, and you did it very well. So congratulations to you for that. Now, Mark, you filmed this during COVID. Uh, did it at all cross your mind delaying it till things got a little better, which they're really not, at least that much better. But did was there, was there any hesitation? Well, we were lucky because we actually shot it before COVID. Oh, okay. And we we still had quite a bit of pickups, uh, a lot of pickup shots we still had to do. We had a lot of wraparound things we had to do to bridge some scenes together. And we had put off doing those. And this is like, I think we were looking at, it was right around, we shot over the summer. Um, and then there was, there started to be these, grumblings about this you know thing in china mm -hmm. and it, you know that really didn't affect that but we couldn't get anybody that was available we couldn't get this thing scheduled right to do the wraparounds and so what had happened was after we had delayed it a couple of months COVID got worse yeah so what we had to actually do is 
we had to proceed without the pickup shots and I found an editor and we came up with some really interesting ways to tie the story together where we didn't need the pickup shots. That's very innovative. I mean, in a, you know, in times of crisis and restrictions like COVID, you have to become innovative. Now, Madison, after the film released uh, May 1st, uh, I'm sure you had some butterflies, May, you know, the day before, you know, seeing what the fan reactions was going to be. What was the reaction you received from friends, family, followers on social media and whatnot? Um, there's been such an outpouring of support, which I've been so grateful for from friends, family, um, followers, people that I've never met before that just were fans of the film have reached out. Um, and all of them were just so blown away by the movie and the film that we were able to create in such a short amount of time. And then also, uh, with the constraints that we had, but all of them, I have so many people that keep telling me they're team hood, man. Um, and are wanting a second film. So Mark, we might have to, <laughs> you might have to go to the drawing board and see because all of my friends and family and um, all the people, they've loved it so far. So I've been very grateful for that. Now, Mark, when you penned the script, uh, was a sequel, you know, maybe somewhere in the back of your mind if this thing became a real big success? Well, the number one rule of thumb is always allow for a sequel. <laughs> Don't kill off your villain, you know, I mean, you just, you have to keep the, the door open. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, I mean, I wanted this, the, the idea behind Hoodman was that he could be a franchisable villain and could go on to do film after successful film, uh, raking in millions upon millions of dollars. Absolutely. Now, as you yeah. mentioned a little while ago, we live in a world full of urban legends what you mentioned was used to be called uh, folklore. Did you choose any combination of existing urban legends or folklore or combine various elements of a few to come up with Hoodman? Yeah, excellent question. Um, he, he is based uh, loosely on the Sandman. Okay. Um, yeah, and the Grim Reaper as well. But hooded figures have been kind of a part of folklore for a very, very long time. I mean, I think there were like cave drawings of uh, hooded kind of demonic creatures way back in the way back when, whatever. Uh, but I found a lot of interesting stuff that kind of lent itself to the storyline. So I kind of incorporated a lot of different supernatural elements. And so, yeah, I would say it's kind of a combination of of the Grim Reaper, the Sandman, and maybe a, a couple of other unique things thrown in, like the fact that he only exists if you believe in him, thus a figment of your imagination. Exactly. And uh, we touched on that earlier with the imaginary scenes versus the reality scenes. Now, when you were filming this, uh, was distribution in play? Did this thing go through the film festival circuit? What did you do after production wrapped and post-production wrapped? Well, I had developed a good relationship with the distributor of my first film, which is Abandoned Dead. And they were very happy with that film and they were anticipating the next one. But there wasn't any real guarantee that they would take it. So there was a lot of concern about it in that I you know, you're never really sure until it's accepted. And I didn't want to go the film festival route. Now, I had done the film festival route with Abandoned Dead, and that came out pretty well because it had won a couple of awards, like it won Fangoria Festival Award, and it won, I think, Hot Springs uh, Horror Festival Award. Nice. Uh, but it took the film out of circulation for well over a year. And that's the problem with going to a, through a film festival is that you can't release the film until it's gone through the festival circuit. Oh. So when the distributor saw the rushes, they said, we want this right away. And I even asked them, I said, and Indie Rights, by the way, of Los Angeles, they are the distributor that has both Abandoned Dead and Hood Man, and they'll be distributing the next film that I just completed. That's awesome. Uh, 
So I've been really lucky in that regard because a lot of filmmakers, and, and as my, myself uh, included, before I met them, before I met Indie Rights and before I had developed a relationship with them, uh, we, you know, most filmmakers don't have really any way of getting their film out there. Distribution is one of the hardest things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, Madison, uh, your character is not like the typical damsel in distress. We're talking about a woman who is strong, determined in her mission. Uh, did that aspect of the story and character build confidence? Or were you at all worried that it would come across the wrong way? Um, the, her strength resonated me from the beginning. With reading the script, I really appreciated that this wasn't just a woman that was just running away from the villain. Um, in so many earlier horror movies, I mean, that was a trope, is that there's the woman running down the street and she's not really fighting back, you know? Yeah. But Ariana had such a fight to her. Um, so I wasn't worried at all because I think that it would resonate with people today. Uh, women are strong and capable and just as, you know, able to fight off the villain as any man. So I felt like women watching it, little girls, if their parents allow them, uh, would uh, really resonate with Ariana and her fight to figure out what happened to her child and save her family and solve the mystery. So... I, I had no worries that people would, uh, you know, feel for Ariana. And personally, but I think it's also important to to add that you know this was a character that wasn't just battling an external villain. Yeah, mm -hmm. was battling herself. Mm -hmm. okay? Because this story is about not being able to come to terms with grief. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's a big problem for a lot of people. It's a, it's a big psychological stumbling block when someone close to you dies. Yeah. And it's a very difficult thing. If you can't process those stages of grief, all kinds of psychological problems can come out. You find and, yourself stuck. Yeah. And, and these other manifestations can come forth from that. Mm -hmm. Things that aren't real. Absolutely. Imaginary things. Or to, to, or to lay the blame on an external force, which is what happened in this case. Absolutely. She couldn't accept the fact that her child was missing, so she had to blame an external force, just like her mother had. Yep, yep. Now, uh, Madison, back to you. The trend in movies and television, which is great over the last several years, is we're starting to see a lot more stronger female characters, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, as a woman, I'm sure you appreciate that and you want to do a lot more stronger, you know, woman character roles. Is that true? Uh, definitely. Uh, I mean, I think that the trend is rather than the women are like stronger than how they would be in real life. It's just more uh, encapsulating how women are like in. Right. You know, yeah. Uh, rather than playing with the tropes that, you know, women aren't capable or uh, women can't, uh, you know, take care of themselves. Now films are showing more realistic portrayals of women, mm -hmm. which I think everyone appreciates. And, and we need that because mm -hmm. film is supposed to be, you know, a lens into real life. So we need to portray how women actually are. So Absolutely. I'm so happy that Hollywood is finally. Yeah, finally. Uh, Right. Well, you know, I, and also think that Hollywood has tried to do that when the film noir guys that came out of the post-war period were doing uh, the unusual stories that they did, like RKO Studios, Warner Brothers. They were creating much stronger female characters when they were doing the noir stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, I mean, but, but then we went back and then the 60s happened and we went back to more victim-oriented female roles. Why, I don't know, because women's liberation was was really strong in the 60s. But and then you go to the reason, 80s, and it's even more women victims, the last yeah, girl standing. Yeah, it's just a bloodbath when you look at that. Yeah. I mean, if you're just talking about horror, I, I don't... It was primarily in horror, but it expanded to other genres as well. Now, Madison, as an up-and-coming star in Hollywood... Uh, are you at all nervous 
not just doing hood man, but any kind of role that you might get boxed into playing a certain type of character. Is that anywhere in the back of your mind or right now you're looking at it? I will deal with each situation as it comes my way. Hmm. Um, I mean, I, it definitely is something that I think every actor and actress has to think about is how they're portrayed uh, in the media and, you know, the projects that they pick. Um, I am still in the place where I am just grateful for what comes my way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, thankfully, I've been offered amazing projects that I believe in and fully support. Um, but yeah, it, it's important for actors to uh, take a step back and, and think about the work that they're doing because it stays forever. It's not just you put something out and, oh, I can forget about it. Um, it's out in the ether for everyone to see. And so forever, um, it's, uh, forever exactly. And now, especially, um, you know, with how much is going on with uh, streaming and everything, um, there's so many uh, projects and so many things going on. So I think it's just important for every actor to just think about what they're doing. And is it something that they'll be proud of and they believe in? And it doesn't necessarily have to be like, high art cinema but no. is it something that you can look back in uh, or on in 10 years 15 years 20 years and look at it and be like you know what i'm i'm proud of the work i did and i'm happy that i did that yeah, I... um so yeah it's something that i think about and I, I try to pick my my work based on that now madison since the movie premiered uh last spring have you noticed an uptick in auditions you're being asked to do uh has has that really grown since May 1st? Uh, it has. No, I'm so, so grateful. Um, it, it was such an amazing opportunity, not only on set, but just afterwards as well, watching it and and then seeing the, the reaction from people. Um, so, yeah, I've been very lucky as far as auditions and then people reaching out to me. So I'm very grateful to Mark for the opportunity that he gave me with it. And Mark, how does that make you feel? I've spoken to a lot of directors and, and they're really proud when they find that, you know, young, new, shining star that Daisy has a real bright future ahead of them like Madison. So how does that make you feel uh, giving Madison the opportunity that you gave her in Hoodman? and seeing her succeed in all her other future projects. Do, is there a part of you that says, I, you know, she's a star and I gave her her first big gig? <laughs> For lack well, of a better term. Feel great. It, it makes me feel great to hear all these wonderful things, you know, that, that all these great roles are coming her way. And, you know, I, I just feel like, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a collaborative medium and, she's helped me every bit as much as I've helped her. So, you know, it, it, it's the whole team that we've had. I mean, we had a wonderful crew. We had a wonderful cameraman. We had a one, everybody that worked on this film was an integral part of making this what it is. And, you know, it's not just a vision of one guy or it's not just one actor that makes these things happen. It's everybody working together. And, mm -hmm. and these are long, long hours it's a lot of hard work for very little pay. So you have to do it as a part of, of what you feel inside in terms of your passion. And, you know, it, it really, for Madison, you know, her passion is acting, but she's also a great team player. And she, she was up for doing, you know, a lot of people don't realize unless they've been on a movie set, just how long the hours are mm -hmm. and just how tired everybody is and then suddenly at like one o'clock in the morning the director snaps their fingers and says okay the lighting setup is ready and this the actor has to get into character it's a lot of waiting deliver, around yeah and deliver and do it in a, in a in a manner that's in continuity with the last scene that was shot so it's my hats off to madison because she's got the ability to be able to do that so i don't feel like i've really given her anything rather than just that we've worked together to make a collaborative medium that much more collaborative the teamwork now the Team film the film mark carries like a lot of films do uh the tone evolves through acts one two and three till you get to the third act where it's very dark and polished uh 
it must be pretty, uh, not easy, but uh, easier to do that on paper when you're writing the script as opposed to when you're in behind that camera and you want to show that evolution, the tone, the, the background, uh, the darker feeling as the film progresses. Is there any uh, method, secret that you use to achieve that? Well, you try to outline that. You try to outline the arc of your story from the beginning. And you work with your production designer. You work with everyone. You work with your actors when you're, when you're developing the characters. And you, you kind of set up a trajectory as to where the script is going to go. And you try to stick to it. But it, it, it becomes increasingly difficult as, as the shoot wears on because you're, you've got to make a lot of compromises. You know, your, your schedule doesn't always allow for you to shoot all the scenes that you've scripted. Uh, or you may not have the location that you had planned on getting. Or an actor can't make it. They can't, they, they get sick. Yeah. They can't be replaced. They don't show up. Uh, so there's all these, <laughs> I've often, I used to wonder before I started making movies, how plots could get so off track and convoluted and how movies can turn out so badly and I realized that it isn't because they're intentionally so it's because filmmakers had to work around problems that they had encountered while shooting yeah. whether it be running out of money or not having a, a location or whatever so you try to keep it on track in terms of the tone and the style of the film and you try to keep that arc you know, it, it, you, you try to maintain that pattern so that there's a change moving from beginning to the middle to the end. And you try to be as consistent as you can in outline form, and then you try to stick to that outline through the shoot. Okay, perfectly explained. Now, uh, how do you feel that this movie has the horror label on it? Uh, you said earlier you don't completely agree with it, and I agree with you. It's not a 100% horror movie. It has very different elements to it. Uh, but even the poster, which we're going to show in a few minutes, the, the artwork, you know, describes just by looking at it, the poster of any film is supposed to give a, the viewer a sort of like image into what this film is about. And the artwork is of Madison with a black background. I believe you're all in red. So it portrays a very dark, scary feeling. Uh, was that done, obviously was done intentionally, but was it to show the audience that this is a horror slash thriller type of film? Yeah, I definitely was geared more toward being a horror image, but the, the actual image being used on the poster was a mistake. How so? Um, it actually, yeah, because I was, I was actually doing screen caps on my computer and when I came across the screen cap of Madison, that's her in the car as she turns toward me. Mm -hmm. We were close up on her. And uh, I hit the wrong key on the computer. It colorized and put a brain on the photo. It, it was unintentional. It was really a slip of the finger. And when that came up on the screen, I was like, That Man. looks good. <laughs> I was like, this looks very cool. Like it reminded me of some other poster I don't know, it was like a movie from the 60s or the 70s. I don't know, it was Rosemary's Baby. Yeah, or yeah the, the poster Exorcist does have that 70s feel to it. Yeah, that's what it was. And I thought, wait a minute. Because before that, I had this silly guy in a hood with a skeleton head. And it just looked awful. Yeah, we've seen that a I thousand times that. already. Yeah. yeah, you know, I was like, I don't want a skeleton. You that's know, awesome. When that popped up, I, and she, her look, because her eyes are like super, like, wide in this shot i mean they look two big giant marbles of fear <laughs> you know and i thought man that's great you know that said, how'd great. you get her eyes to bug out of her head like that i said well no we just we wrapped a belt around her and we <laughs> <laughs> now mark yeah. uh if you were to uh, put yourself in a category in regards to writing would you say writing horror is your strong suit? Yeah, I think horror, horror, uh, thriller, suspense, definitely. Yeah, that's something I've always loved. I've always loved reading horror, and I've always loved horror movies. Uh, but I've always liked 
the kind of horror that was more psychological. Mm -hmm. So like, if you think like a movie of like Wait Until Dark mm -hmm. or, you know, based on the play, which was also, you know, pretty suspenseful and scary, but not really like horror in the sense of like people getting cut up or, yeah. you know, the slasher type or monsters even so much as the psychological suspense kind of movies. So I'd say more along those lines. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I mean, I love a good story. I love a good story. I love good acting. And I have the seen... Horror, the horror community isn't really necessarily into that. No. You know, the the, the horror, the, the younger generation now, they don't want that slow burn. They don't, they want no. fast MTV cuts. They want lots of guts and craziness and i you know i can't go there I'm, unfortunately that's not my i mean that's I, not my forte <laughs> i can sit and watch and i have done it and it's entertaining to watch a bloody just slasher film there are a lot yeah, of great ones of out there but yeah. the films that really grab me are the ones that tell a good story and i saw a movie recently that is the perfect example. You don't need a huge budget to make an amazing film. You need a good story. You need good actors and somebody who knows what they're doing behind the camera and not, you don't need millions upon millions of dollars to do that. And I think Hoodman is a great example of that as well. Thank now, you, now, that. Oh, I'm I'm absolutely dead serious, and those are the films that I like. I love sitting down on my couch at night and seeking out the films that I have not seen advertised, the ones that don't get advertisement, reading the synopsis that sounds interesting, and then you find some real hidden treasures and gems if you do that. Oh, yes. Now, Madison, your role deals a lot with tension and fear, uh, so when you're doing that scare moment, okay, whether it's a scream or you got to just put on that look of absolute terror on your face, what do you do? Where do you, where do you take your mind to give us that just horrified look? Oh, um, so it was, uh, it was so, uh, hard on set not because of the conditions but because we all got along so well uh, it was the conditions <laughs> yeah no, <laughs> no but like everyone was just such good friends and so between takes everyone's having such a good time and so we're having that and then i'm having to take a couple minutes to find that horror and so yeah, for yeah. me it's just kind of stepping away for a little bit or if i can't step away uh, you know, just having a little bit of quiet to kind of putting myself in that state mentally and also physically. I feel like the body, um, you know, holds a lot of tension. And uh, if you feel it in different parts of your body, you'll be able to emote it and mm -hmm. it will be able to come off on screen. Mm -hmm. And so just kind of putting myself in that place for a couple minutes before we start shooting, um, it, I'd be able to get there. And then for, for the tougher scenes, like scenes, uh, one in particular that I'm thinking about, the hospital scene mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of the movie, um, that takes a little bit longer. And, um, you know, I, I have to spend, you know, quite a bit of time just kind of thinking about what's going on and putting myself in that state. Um, and everyone on set was just so respectful and amazing and, and allowing me that kind of space to get there because it is difficult and it's hard and it's hard to get out of it afterwards as well. Yeah. Um, it's with you. Yeah. Um, at the end so of this, having, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. But, at the, the, but at there the, is a secret weapon, you know, as things get laid and, and I'd, I'd like to, to kind of advise some of the younger directors here that one of the main tools that you really need is a cattle prod. <laughs> Mark. <laughs> All right. I gave it up. Oh my I God. gave up the secret. Now you're going to have all these directors that are going to be using the cattle prod to, evo to, to evoke the kind of fear I evoked in Madison. And you know, my work is just going to be simply... And wonderful the set was. <laughs> He's talking about cattle prods. <laughs> Completely different experiences we had. <laughs> now, Mark, if you're not getting the performance that you really want, 
Give cattle, me the cattle prop. prop. But only as a last resort. <laughs> only as a last resort. That's just the threat of it can get you the results you need. So with that in mind, Mark, what was the most challenging sequence scene that presented itself in Hoodman for you? Most challenging scene. One that just, man, was not going the way you wanted it to go. <laughs> Every one of them? <laughs> no! <laughs> the hardest scene to do. Um, was it maybe the attic? I know the attic was... Well, the attic was it was especially difficult, yeah. Because we, you know, attics, trying to find an attic in Southern California is... Uh, next to impossible uh so we had to find a house that actually had an upper floor of it was completely gutted and then uh, so just the sheer difficulty of of setting that up and doing the set design on it that was difficult but when we actually started to shoot it was okay but well, that was the one where we had the stunt man there right yeah, we had a lot of stunts a lot of uh crawling around uh through cops yeah. for me <laughs> maybe it was the most difficult scene for me <laughs> Uh, I, I wanted if I were to reshoot that again, I wanted I would would have had more uh, more interaction between her and Hoodman. I'd gotten a few comments about that, and I think we took it down a little bit too dark in post. Okay, well, that's but, fair. You know, you always think of like I'd do it differently. Yeah, next yeah, time. yeah, yeah. Uh, now, do you already have uh, if the opportunity presents itself? A good idea of where to take a sequel when if if it comes up not really <laughs> uh because i don't want to i try i could but i i don't want to do that i really don't because a lot of that's going to depend on what the budget's going to be what the locations are going to be because it's really the locations that dictate at this level of independent filmmaking it's your locations that dictate your story that's true that's true now let's take a look at some screenshots of the film. Here's the uh, poster. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Here's the poster that we were talking about earlier. That was the mistake. There we go. Not having a good night there. <laughs> In the. Uh... And this is the uh, detective that's played by Brock. He's played by Brock Morse. He is yep. a detective. It's on the on the story he's trying to get to the the bottom of why her son disappeared yes and absolutely you know cops do not believe in urban legends there's madison no. again let's see and just look at those just look at that face i mean yeah she's, you know it's just she she's able to capture the essence of that character it's the you know just like locked in just the look right right there right. all right there you are again mm -hmm. and is this as you're reading about the urban legend of the hood man correct okay uh, to solve the mystery of the hood man okay and she's she's running down clues mm -hmm. she's becoming her own detective Mm -hmm. And Madison, what's this scene right here? Um, so this is me um, with uh, the actress uh, who played Sky Miss Roberts. My sister, Sky Roberts. Uh, she is incredible. Not only an amazing actress, but also the sweetest, sweetest kid. We had so much fun on set. Nice. Um, my, those were probably my favorite scenes to do, just because we would just be laughing and having fun the entire time. Now, Mark, how how is it working? Uh, with you as a director, what are your personal experience? Do you have any special approaches when working with kids on set? Well, I, it's, it's the same approach that I would use with an adult. Um, it, you know, I mean, if, if you have a child actress that's been in quite a few roles, they're they're already pretty far along, so they don't need to be told or taught what to do. And that's that's I take that approach with all the actors. I don't I don't tell them. I don't do like line readings. I don't tell them how I want them to do it. I, I don't go through the actions as some directors might. I set the scenario up and then I allow them to take take the character where where they need to go with it. And the same holds true with the with the child actress. Sky Roberts was very knowledgeable of what she needed to do. She knew her lines. She knew the character, and. The only thing I had to direct her to do was her reactions of fear. 
mm -hmm. uh, especially like during the the times during which she was being attacked or when she was when she could actually see the hood man nice that's great she didn't have anything to look at yeah to react to so that's when i that's when i you know kind of directed her the kind of expression she needed to have that kind of thing but otherwise no the actors direct themselves i just madison facilitate if we it. pretend mark is not here is that accurate or is he a very controlling director no that is extremely accurate he was an amazing director in the sense that he really put a lot of trust into his actors and gave us a general you know guideline of what he wanted to see with the scene and if we needed help with something he would always be there but he um was very um collaborative with his directing which i appreciated so much that is awesome so mark we, we are pretty and one, much and I, and I do want to mention one thing because because you showed that one photo of the scene between uh madison and sky in the bed mm -hmm. i always allow if there's time for the actors to do a completely improvised version of the scene and you know what a lot of directors do that because i hear it really it helps the actors oh yeah yeah, you, know? you could come. There's a real magic can happen with it. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and it did in that scene because that almost that entire the end of that entire scene was all improvisation. Yeah, they yeah. were all. Completely. And I've also heard stories where you know the director got the scene he wanted. He let the actors play. Didn't even let them know that he was filming. Yeah, and he got yeah. even better scenes that way. Billy Friedkin does that. A yeah, lot. yeah. Now. Uh, we're out. Uh, we're out of time, Mark. Tell people. Oh no! Tell people where they can watch Hoodman. Well, Hoodman is uh, available on Tubi TV. That's T U B I. It's also available on Amazon Prime. It's on Apple TV. It's on IMDb TV. Awesome. Uh, wherever great movies are streamed. Absolutely. And Tubi and IMDb TV are AVOD. It's uh, advertising supported. So, you know. Completely free to watch. Yep. Just watch the advertisements and uh, help us out with that. Greatly appreciated. Absolutely. And, and I, saying greatly appreciated is a good segue to, to say to you, John, that uh, we really appreciate you having us come on and talk a bit about our indie film because it's my pleasure. we appreciate the exposure as well as. Uh, being able to share with the audience some of the some of our you know yeah. inside thoughts about it and i love hearing stories i love independent films i'm a big supporter of independent films you guys did a great job madison you were amazing we love your show, by the way. thank you thank you so much mark thank you so much madison uh any final thoughts you want to share madison before we go no i just really had a great time talking with you and talking with mark again and uh Getting back to Hoodman. It was, Absolutely. This is My pleasure. How about you, Mark? Uh, I, well, I just want to say uh, thank you, Madison, uh, once again, for doing such a wonderful job in the film and for continuing to help in, uh, in getting the word out. Uh, the only other thing I would mention is that um, I am going to be writing Hoodman as a novel. Oh. And, yes, and uh, I hope to have that, hope that, have that out finished and out by this time next year. That's like the reverse of how it normally works. First you get the novel <laughs> and then you get the screenplay. <laughs> so that's a very... Yeah, it's a little unconventional, I yeah. realize. But, yeah. you know, I, I just, I want to expand the story. There are so many things that I wanted to say and you just can't explore it all in no, the movie. So you can't I want to put do it in a 90 minute up. film. Uh, you know, books allow you so much more leeway uh, to tell a story the way you want to tell it. I want to thank yes. Mark W. Curran, Madison. Am I pronouncing your last name correctly? It's actually Curran. Curran. Mark yeah, W. But, Curran. But, but it doesn't matter. You can uh, pronounce it any way you want. It. Mark W. Curran and Madison Spear, the star who plays Ariana on Hoodman. Thank you both for coming on our show. This hour just flew by. Guys, okay. check out Hoodman on all the places that Mark just mentioned. It's a great movie. Uh, fans love it. In fact, uh, I just checked it out again before we went live. It has a 6.0 rating on IMDb, which is not easy to get. Trust me. So thank you guys to for coming on our show. Thank you to our audience for tuning in. Until next time, on behalf of Madison, Mark, and myself, stay safe and stay walking. Bye-bye, everybody. 
Thank you.